Hey everyone, my name is Sarah. I'm the Real Simple Mama and today's video is all about pain. Specifically, a condition that I was recently diagnosed with called myofascial pain syndrome or MPS. And so I wanted to do a video talking about what MPS is, what my symptoms and my diagnosis experience was like, as well as giving you some suggestions that have helped me as a young mom of two kids and someone who has a very active life just kind of helped me get through and not just survive, but thrive with MPS. So stick around. So thank you so much for watching this video. I'm hoping that it's going to help educate you whether you or a loved one is potentially being diagnosed with MPS which is a similar but less severe condition like fibromyalgia. And what I'd like to do is give a very quick definition of what MPS is, and then I'll go through what my symptoms and my experience was like just trying to get diagnosed with something that explained how I was feeling. And then at the end, I will give you the suggestions that have been given to me by my specialists that just really help me on a daily basis. So, I have had severe endometriosis and arthritis for years just because of different things. And I recently found, like I said, within the last year that I got diagnosed with MPS, which again stands for myofascial pain syndrome. Now the fascia is sort of like a covering that's on your muscles and it's supposed to be smooth and spread evenly across your muscle tissue, but sometimes it gets bunched up and that can cause some fascial pain and things like deep tissue massage and foam rolling can help with those problems. But a really super quick definition of MPS is it's sort of like fibro light and fibromyalgia being a pain condition that is incurable and something that really people didn't know a lot about 10 years ago. And it's also diagnosed by sort of a process of elimination. And you basically find out, well, you don't have this other serious condition, you don't have a pinched nerve, you don't have multiple sclerosis. So with all of the symptoms you're explaining and the tests we've done, we're gonna say that from diagnosis of elimination, you have fibro. MPS is diagnosed the same way. And like I said, we'll get into my story and how all of that happened in a little while. But myofascial pain syndrome differs from fibromyalgia in two ways. The first way is that it theoretically can be lessened over time with different strategies and maybe even reversed. And the other is just that it's not considered as severe as fibromyalgia. And fortunately right now, fibromyalgia is something that is incurable and it is normally something that is more progressive over time. So as you age, it will probably get worse. And really the only thing you can do for fibromyalgia other than trying to have an anti-inflammatory diet be as active as possible is pain management. And that basically means being on prescription pain medication or something else that gives you pain relief pretty much for the rest of your life. And that's terrifying. And I, when I was starting to hear the words fibromyalgia as a potential cause for what I was going through, I was reading horror stories online about people who basically now are just hermits. They never even leave their house because the pain and the fatigue is so bad. And also because these conditions are invisible. So someone sees you on the street and they don't understand that there's something wrong with you, right? So that's in a nutshell of myofascial pain syndrome and fibromyalgia. Basically what's happening is the nerves that go all through your body, right? Like an electrical system that sends signals up to your brain, which is the computer that interprets the signals. Instead of something just being annoying or uncomfortable, it's just maddeningly painful. And it's not like an obsession or a compulsion type thing like OCD where, oh, it's bothering me that the door isn't closed all the way, I have to get up and close the door. This is something that to you might be annoying or uncomfortable or kind of scratching your skin, but to me it's causing pain. So I'll give you a few quick examples and then we'll go into more of my story. So one example is if you put your sock on and that little seam that goes on the toe is kind of like crooked, it's not really where it's supposed to be, maybe it's gone under your toes or something, it might kind of bother you, but you would probably still be able to put on your shoes and go to work. It would just be something that eh, kind of annoyed you. For me, it would be so distracting and so uncomfortable and so painful that I wouldn't be able to 
just ignore it and go on with my day. I would have to fix it. Again, it's not because it's a compulsion. It's because it's actually causing me physical pain because my nerves are firing and just going crazy and basically cranking up the sensitivity of pain, discomfort, temperature changes, things like that. But to me, it's a huge extreme change and a big problem and makes me really uncomfortable or really in pain. Whereas to you, it seems like it's not that big of a deal, Sarah. Like, what's the problem? Another example is my husband who is, you know, affectionate and wants to help come for me. And I've been dealing with pain issues. We've known each other since high school and, you know, it's just gotten increasingly worse. He'll try to comfort me and I'm leaning so I could show you, but he'll try to comfort me and he'll start rubbing my arm. If he will, I can't even do it. If he rubs the same area of my arm, just with his hand, if he rubs the same area of my arm more than two or three times, it feels like he is using sandpaper and trying to scrape my skin off. And I have to physically move. Again, not, it's not a compulsion. It's not that it sounds weird. It's not that it's an OCD thing and it's the wrong number. Everything has to be balanced. And it's a control. It's not that. It's that those signals going to my brain are not like, okay, he's been rubbing the same area. Like it's it's getting warm. There's friction or it's a little uncomfortable. It's, it's causing me so much pain that I have to like jerk away from my loving husband. So the way that I got diagnosed, and it, it's actually taken a couple of years, it started out with me figuring out what was going on with problems with weight loss, getting my thyroid tested, getting hormones tested, and going through all of these different specialists. So I'll go through that really, really quickly. As always, I started with my primary care and I was talking to him about how I felt really tired all the time and how I'm working really hard to lose weight, but my body doesn't wanna lose weight. And this was when I weighed way more than I do right now. I had started my weight loss journey and like I plateaued and like just, coasted and stopped as soon as I started and I was really tired and I started to feel like tingling pain in my lower body and this started after my second my last child had been born so it wasn't like weird things going on because of pregnancy and we got my hormones tested and my thyroid tested and a lot of things were off but not enough to where he felt it was appropriate to do anything so I ended up going back to him about every four or six months for almost two years before finally I said I need to go talk to somebody else because you're not listening to me. And on paper, you know, me recording everything in my diet and my supplements and you guys who have watched my channel, you know, I'm a data fiend. Like I type up everything. I have everything in lists and organized and documented and measured and everything. So on paper, I looked like somebody who was doing a really good job of managing their diet and being more active and taking the right types of supplements. And my blood pressure looked great and my cholesterol looked awesome and my thyroid was off a little bit, but not enough to medicate. And so I basically got frustrated and got to the point where I said, I need to go talk to somebody else. Since at that problem, at that point, the main problem was nerve pain. I was referred to a neurologist and a really intelligent guy. I had a lot of really good conversations with him, just talking about the science of neurology and things like that. We did brain scans and then we did nerve conduction tests, which is basically to see how fast the electricity is traveling down your body to see if you have something like a pinched nerve. <laughs> In my brain scan, because he was checking for multiple sclerosis or a brain tumor, we found out that I do have a brain tumor and it's called a meningioma and it's about the size of a large grape and it's right up there underneath, <laughs> ignore the grays, underneath right in here on my sensory cortex and I thought okay sensory cortex that would probably be the part of my brain that's like interpreting all of these signals from my nerves right oh my god that's what it is and it's not a cancerous tumor or anything but you can't really do anything except have surgery to remove it because of where it is so went back to the neurologist for the follow-up after getting the radiology report and the neurologist says well we think it's incidental it's not cancerous and I don't think it's what's causing your problem. So we're just going to leave it in there. You have a brain tumor. Cool. You know, go have a party and tell people about it and you'll be like the coolest person there. But we don't need to operate on it. We'll keep an eye on it every year or two and measure it and make sure it's not growing. But you may have had it your whole life and it's just like this weird thing about you that's incidental. Okay, bye. Have a great day. So... In professional medical terms, my neurologist basically broke up with me. The good news, of course, is that I don't have multiple sclerosis, which would have been a very serious diagnosis, and I don't have a brain tumor that is a danger. But I had now still not really learned anything about what was going on with me other than, hey, cool, I'm walking around with a brain tumor. So then I was recommended to go to an endocrinologist, and an endocrinologist tests all kinds of levels of 
your hormones and your thyroid and all different vitamin and supplement levels and all that kinds of stuff. Found an endocrinologist and I love her and she's great. I got all of my stuff tested for that. And at that point, this was like a year and a half ago. I still haven't really found anything out. And again, on paper, all my levels look amazing. I don't take a ton of supplements, but I take a few. I take iron because I'm very passionate about donating blood and you have to have a high enough iron count or you can't donate. And I was taking magnesium to help me with sleeping and I was taking vitamin D, I think. And that's it. That and birth control for my endometriosis and biotin. And again, we're trying to figure out multiple things. Why I'm having this like nerve tingling pain, sort of like, you know, when your foot falls asleep and it's that pins and needles, that feeling that drives you nuts. It's a feeling like that and a really deep ache and like a funny bone feeling all at the same time. It's just this maddening, I can't sit still, I just wanna go crazy. And meanwhile, I'm still going on with my life and taking care of my kids, doing my writing and everything else that I do. And I can't figure out anything that's working. I'm getting more active at this point, doing more than, you know, just walking, but I'm actually working with weights and doing strength training and stuff like that. And it was good to hear that there wasn't something seriously wrong. Oh, I also found out in doing <laughs> ultrasounds of my thyroid that I have a huge cyst on my thyroid that's also not cancer but they're not gonna do anything about it and they think it's just incidental. So I've just got stuff going on all over the place, but nothing's explaining why I feel the way I feel. I was dealing with migraines and problems like that. So at, at some point, because of all of this stuff going on, I've also got a cyst on my thyroid, but it's also incidental. So I'm almost getting to the point where I'm going into sort of a depression because I look like I feel fine, right? It's an invisible condition. And on paper, my diet looks really super healthy. My endocrinologist wanted to see what supplements I take, the diet that I'm doing, the workouts that I'm doing. Every time I'm going in to see my doctors, my weight is going down, not by very much, but they were happy that it was actively going down. So the endocrinologist said, I think you're doing great. We can't do anything for you. I think you should go see a rheumatologist. I'll stop here and say that I feel kind of embarrassed and kind of stupid that I didn't go see a rheumatologist when it was first recommended to me. I waited almost a year because, and this was my fault, I thought that a rheumatologist basically just did pain management. Like I was going to go to the rheumatologist so that I could get on prescription pain medication to help me deal with the symptoms that I'm dealing with. And I didn't want to do that. I thought, you know, this pain is, is maddening. That's a word that keeps coming back. You know, it's so frustrating. It drives me crazy. I hate it. It's really bad at night when I lay down. You know, it's just like my electrical system, you know, my nervous system is just malfunctioning constantly and it's just making me nuts. But I also thought I'm in my early thirties. Like I am not ready to be on, you know, pain medication to where I may not be able to drive. I may not be able to work. I'm not ready to wave that white flag and say, I'm done. I, I need to go in and get this. So I waited after talking to a couple of other friends, one who has fibro and one who has lupus they explained to me more like, no, our rheumatologist doesn't just do that. They can help out with rheumatoid arthritis. They can help out with all of these other things. And it's not just about pain medication. So I got a recommendation for an amazing rheumatologist. And so I went to her and she is a great lady. She is no BS. She's very intelligent. She herself has dealt with some autoimmune stuff. And we started talking. And first of all, she said, I think your condition would be way worse as far as how you're feeling and what diagnosis we're gonna come up with if you hadn't been actively working to lose weight, which means you're eating really healthy, right? And you're drinking a lot of water. And that I had been going to a Rosti, which I also recommend. I've been going to a chiropractor and I've been working out on a regular basis. She basically said that me being so active and trying to lose weight and thus eating healthily and drinking a ton of water, that kind of thing, is probably what has saved me from having a fibro diagnosis right now. And I am 36 now. So that was kind of like, oh, whoa, geez. Because again, fibro is not curable. It's treatable, which does usually mean you can do some other regimens and things at home, but a big part of that is going to be you being on something like Lyrica, which is, you know, an anti-seizure slash heavy pain medication. So talking to my rheumatologist, I told her about all of my symptoms and it was just that I never feel well. It doesn't matter how much sleep I've gotten. I always have that fatigue. Waking up in the morning is hard for me. You know, I don't know what the deal is with my sleep cycle. And we're still dealing with, you know, young kids who don't sleep through the night all the time. But I wasn't having like 
conscious wakings like all the time where I was fully awake. And I also didn't feel like it was a sleep apnea type situation. I know multiple people who have that. I didn't feel like that. I wasn't, you know, narcoleptic or anything like that. But it's just, I just, it doesn't matter how much sleep I get. And big surprise, I use a sleep tracking app on my phone on the far end of my nightstand. So it's not right by my head. But just to see, you know, if I'm snoring or if I'm moving around a lot and it senses a lot of noise and I can keep track of things I did that day. Like, did I have caffeine that night or did I eat after 9 p.m.? Things like that. Hello, data tracking. But we just couldn't figure out why I just never felt rested. I never wake up and feel like, oh, thank God I slept last night. I feel so much better. I never felt that way. And I always had aches and pains, particularly in my lower body and particularly in joints. So it's not like a muscle soreness or my muscles are growing or like I slept funny or I was sitting like on my feet, you know, when you sit kind of weird, but just this always just like this deep ache, not a burning pain, not a, not a hot tingling pain, just, just a deep ache. Like my body always hurt. And then of course I'm still dealing with what we think now may be a hormone imbalance. So I'm going back to get hormones tested again. So my rheumatologist, like I told you, fibro and MPS, it's sort of a diagnosis of elimination. We know you don't have um, multiple sclerosis. We know you don't have cancer. We know it's not a pinched nerve. So let's do a couple of other scans. So then she did, I don't know what the name of it is, but it's sort of like a joint test. And I believe there are 18 different points. And what my rheumatologist basically did was put pressure with her hands on 18 different points of my body to see how I would react. Would I scream? Would I slap her? Would I just kind of stand there? I'm like, meh, what would I do? And for, I think 13 of them, I would say, oh, like that feels really tight or that feels bruised or that feels tense. I didn't say that hurt and I didn't say there's pain, but a lot of them, it felt like very sensitive, like a tender spot that was bruised. And after talking to me more and getting to know me, and I feel like she can read me really well, she said, I feel like those spots are pain, but because you work out as much as you do and because you are really tough, that you don't connect it with directly being pain. You consider it tightness or stiffness or tension or another word, but really it's pain. You're feeling a negative sensation there. And so she basically diagnosed me with MPS. So that's my diagnosis as of right now. We're hoping that it's not going into full-blown fibromyalgia. But now what I wanted to do was just talk to you about sort of what I'm doing now to help with MPS. So in explaining a little bit more about it, we believe, and we don't know, because remember, again, the, the terms fibro and MPS are both pretty new scientific terms, and there's so much that we still don't understand. But what they think happens is either you have a traumatic life event or you have chronic crap sleep, <laughs> which everybody who is a new parent and probably particularly a mother is like, oh no. <laughs> so having a traumatic event, which may have even been my car accident from 2008, I don't know, or just having chronic bad sleep. You know, I breastfed my kids for the first one for a year and a half and the second one for three years and they were in my bed during that time. So I mean, you know, I wasn't sleeping through the night for, you know, four and a half or five years. And then of course, even now they're not nursing anymore. I mean, you still don't sleep super well just because your kids get a little bit older. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to make this video to kind of be like, you need to get sleep, please. Um, and if you can do it without, you know, a prescription sleeping pill, that's great. Sleepy time extra tea is wonderful. It helps me a lot. Making a lavender spray that's mixed with just filtered water and witch hazel so it doesn't stain and doesn't discolor fabrics. So that's really great. Um, you can hear my rain sound right now, my ambient rain sounds that just helps me be desensitized to noises going on outside my window or, you know, the dogs scratching around or having little puppy dreams and stuff like that. But the first thing my rheumatologist said is we've got to fix your sleep. Now I will say I was given a prescription sleeping medication and I take a, like literally a little piece of the sleeping pill as needed and I can take it right before bed. There's also an over-the-counter mix of, and I forget what they are, forgive me, one of them's melatonin, I want to say one of them's ginger root, and I don't remember what the third one is, but the medication is called Alteril, A-L-T-E-R-I-L, and that's a supplement that you can take, it might be valerian root, 
sorry, it's a supplement that you can take an hour before bed and it's not prescription. And you can get a month's worth around here for about 15, 16 bucks. So those are some options to help. But she basically said, you need to get your husband to do the night wakings. You have got to start sleeping because if your brain gets to the point where it is so fatigued for so long that it flips into fibro mode, that's a permanent switch. Your brain can never switch back once you're in fibro mode. Now I'll say it is sort of nebulous as far as, am I still in MPS land or have I switched over to fibro? You don't really know. You kind of just have to try all of these methods and these techniques that you can. And if you feel like it's responding, then it might be MPS. And the beautiful part about that is you could potentially lessen your symptoms or even make it disappear over time. And that's what I am trying to do. Worst case scenario, I'm trying to play like, you know, Alice in Wonderland and run as fast as I can for as long as I can to stay away from that fibro diagnosis. Because once I'm taking that pain medication for life, you know, then it's a matter of sort of conceding what you're going to be able to do and not do. And your mobility might get less and less over time. The weight gain might come back because I'm battling that. So I thought, no, I'm not at the breaking point yet to where my pain is so bad I can't function because I am stubborn as hell if you haven't figured it out already. And so right now I want to work on building as much muscle as I can because that'll help me for years to come. I want to work on getting to my ideal body weight and getting rid of as much percentage body fat as I can because that'll be easier on my joints and it'll help me run around with my kids. So I want to be active and do everything that I possibly can do for as long as I can. And then once I feel like I need to surrender, and forgive me for getting emotional, once I feel like I need to surrender, then a big side effect of this pain medication being weight gain, then I'll say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm to the point that I need to accept that as a possibility because the pain is just, I, I can't deal with it anymore. So the big thing in helping with MPS and fibro or just keeping both of those away is getting good sleep. Being able to get into a deep sleep cycle on a regular basis is something that you need to do. So the next thing that I'm doing that I feel makes a difference and I've actually suggested it to a few people who have chronic pain and it's helping them too. So yay for my rheumatologist is taking a really hot shower really quick as soon as you wake up in the morning and stretching while you're in the shower. So I found out a couple of things. I don't wash my hair. I don't shave in this shower early in the morning. I just literally get out of bed. I grab my retainer and I go into the bathroom and turn on super hot water, as hot as you can stand. And you just want to be in there for five or 10 minutes. You can spray your face if you want. And when you have hot water hitting you in the face, you don't feel pain. So that's kind of nice when you wake up in the morning and it's the, oh no, you know, I have to get up. I have you, if you're like me, you start thinking about everything that you have to do and I do not sleep late. So you get in the shower and do as much stretching as you can. You don't have to get down on the floor of the shower. Okay. Don't, don't do anything like that, but just doing different stretches where you're getting your, your arms and your hands up behind your head. And, um, you know, I do this whole thing with my outstretched arms where I'm just rotating so that my forearms get rotated. I touch my toes. I do some side lunges, you know, get yourself one of those, those shower assist bars if you need to, which sounds like I'm only in my thirties. I know, but that way I feel like I can get myself a little bit more limber while the hot water is hitting me, but I don't need to shave at that point. I don't need to wash my hair or wash my body or anything like that. I do that after my workout. This is just get up, get nice and hot and steamy in the shower and like knock out some of that initial pain and stiffness. If you can work out every day, even if you start at five or 10 minutes a day with like one or three pound weights, we're talking like get a can of soup out of your kitchen and do some bicep curls and some stuff with that, then that will help. If you can do walking, it doesn't have to be high impact. You don't have to go climb a mountain or anything, but just getting your body moving. The more you can do that, the better you will be and you can hopefully build on to that with time. The other thing that I'm doing is keeping in mind that for me, acetaminophen, which is like Tylenol, works better for me for nerve pain than ibuprofen does. Ibuprofen can also cause water retention. So it can like throw off some other things going on in your body because a side effect of ibuprofen is you hold on, you retain more water. So Tylenol eight hour has worked for me. And again, I don't get anything for free. This is truly what's worked. And I'm an expert in pain, unfortunately. And sometimes if I know I'm going to go like running that day, or I've got just the pain, this is bad in the morning and I feel like I cannot deal with it. Then I take Tylenol eight hour in the morning. And by the evening, I don't feel like I need to take another dose before bed. I'm good. And I just coast in the afternoon or evening until it's time to get ready to go to sleep. 
Hot baths work really well as well if you can do Epsom salts. And the other thing you should do as often as you can is knowing that for MPS and theoretically for Fibro too, you start holding your stress because that's another thing, chronic stress, right? You start holding your stress here at the back of your skull, like right where your skull connects with like, what is it, C1, the beginning of your cervical spine. And then as your stress gets worse, so like if I'm only a little stressed out, it's only like right here. If my stress gets worse, it starts to go down my spine. So if you can at night, get your partner or somebody to do a massage. And I mean, they don't have to use oils. They don't have to be like a, a professional masseuse or anything, but just working here, like on the nape of your neck and working down your shoulders. And then if your stress is really bad, you'll feel it all the way down into your mid and lower back. But getting a massage like that or a back rub like that on a regular basis can really help. I also have a neck roller massager thing that I can use in the shower because it's just a piece of plastic that I can use in the shower or I can use on my own because I know that I hold tension and stress right here. So part of the reason, like I said, that I'm doing this video is to help, you know, moms <laughs> or parents of young children because we're always exhausted and we're always really stressed out. And I don't want our generation to end up with like a ton of people being diagnosed with MPS and being diagnosed with fibro. So I would love to hear those of you who are in a chronic pain community or you're dealing with a, a condition, um, particularly if you are younger, like let's say 45, or younger, or if you are a young parent, because this is sort of a unique position for us to be in, right? Most people our age are not dealing with stuff like this. And so, you know, for me being someone who wants to go to the gym and be really toned and I'm doing play groups and I'm on the PTA, but yet I'm dealing with all of this stuff behind the scenes that nobody can see. So I'd love to hear if there are strategies that are working for you, but remember doing hot showers, fixing your sleep, doing an anti-inflammatory diet, which is something I'll be experimenting with in the next few months and getting massages on a regular basis. Those will be the things that'll help you with chronic pain. So I hope that this has been helpful. Let me know in the comments if you've got questions, suggestions. I appreciate you listening to my story. Good luck to you guys.